Groupies, proud and fearless. The touch and feel of human skin is the most ultimate trip you could ever take. Always ready for a little backstage fun. I was a woman who went out. I wanted to have sex with rock stars, and I did. And rock stars more than happy to oblige. It's kind of like being in a candy store sometimes. I want that one and that one and that and that one and that one. Everybody's in it for the music. That's why we're musicians. We love to do music. That's a given. Now, why are you really in it? Yeah. Money and girls. Glamorous in the 60s and 70s. Extravagant in the 80s. Undercover in the 90s. They're pushing the limits of the rock and roll wildlife. They had this mud shop in their hand, and they had this chick. They were, like, hitting her on the back with the mud shop. Best peanut butter and jelly sandwich you've ever seen. It gets better. We ain't done yet. If you thought groupies disappeared with women's lib, think again. I'm sorry, but for me right now, this is the best part of the show. Next, the VH1 News special, The Secret World of Groupies. Product of the swinging 60s. For the first time, women weren't just sleeping with rock stars, they were bragging about it. That's when an elite group of femme fatale went public to claim their crowns. Behold the famous groupie, they are the like as two peas. And where the other goes, the other goes. Ms. Pamela, Sable Star, Lori Maddox, and the group known as Girls Together Outrageously were as beautiful as models, but they wanted to be more than just ordinary fans. Their love of music made them the perfect companions for touring rockers. In the 60s and 70s, there was more of a sense of camaraderie, which isn't to say that it wasn't also about sex, but it was also a lot about hanging out. These women saw themselves as accessing the music more than accessing sexual conquest. But for many, it was all about sexual liberation. I was a pioneer. I was brave. I was going out and getting what I wanted, you know? I was popping my birth control pill on the strip, and I was my own woman. I, I don't care what anybody thinks. I went after what I wanted, and I got it. So Gloria Steinem can just go jump in the lake. Groupies redefined the relationship between rock stars and their fans with behavior that has always tried to piss off the family-oriented crowd. There was a chick called the Butter Queen, and she got her name because they used to use butter on her all the time. I'm not a groupie, I'm the groupie. I'm the international Butter Queen. At one show, we had, um, there, was two, there were two Spanish hookers there, and uh, we all got naked and had a butter party. The plaster casters, groupies who turned some of history's hardest rockers into works of art. Well, part of them anyway. Master, caster, grab a hold of the faster. In art class, we started doing plaster casts, and one day the teacher said you could plaster cast almost anything that's solid. In fact, bring in any old object from home, and tomorrow we'll make a cast of it. He thought. <laughs> For three decades, Cynthia Plastercaster has immortalized the rock and roll members of everyone. From Ministries' Chris Conley... It's not necessarily recognizable as a whole at this time. ...to guitar god Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> I think Jimi Hendrix is the best one she had. They're so lifelike. Cynthia first started mixing plaster to meet rock stars. In the beginning, it was much more of an icebreaker than an art form. I was a shy, Catholic-raised, virginal a wannabe groupie that was too shy to seduce rock stars and make a long story short found it was a really good way to get laid. Much to her surprise she became recognized as a bona fide sculptor. I met Frank Zappa and he told me I was an artist. Cynthia had this little brown satchel about like this with a logo on the side that said Plaster Casters of Chicago and um, I thought it was one of the weirdest stories I'd ever heard. I'm thrilled that but this incredible artist himself thinks I'm an artist. I think it's really campy, you know. Cynthia's dead serious about it, you know, and that's what's so beautiful about her trip, you know, but I just think it's fun. 
more than 30 years later, Cynthia is still perfecting her craft, and the process is as complicated as ever. When the subject comes bursting into the kitchen with his gorgeous looking penis, I ask him to uh, dip his penis into my mixing container, and he has to think hard for about a minute, and he just kind of falls out of the container, and I pour plaster into this negative impression he's made, and he goes off his merry way, and I get to keep the, the grooviest souvenir of all. Coming up, Led Zeppelin makes mud shark a dirty word. Shocked. I, I think I was in shock for the whole thing. Girl rockers get their own kicks. We were just so jaded. So we'd be out there like, and thinking I can't wait till the show's over so I can go get laid. Plus. Hey, Mom! Backstage with the new generation of groupies. It's like the Howard Stern show. It's like two chicks, you got the blonde and the brunette, making out. Do you guys even know each other? of arena rock in the late 60s exposed millions to the power of a band on the road. Rock stars weren't just celebrities, they were touring royalty. And wherever they went, groupies followed. No band was more famous for its groovy scene than those original monsters of rock, Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin started the trend of girls just doing anything to be with these people. Because they, they were bored. These bands would get very bored on the road. They toured a lot in the early days. They found it, you know, titillating and, and it, it amused them that these girls would do anything. So they would like push it as far as they see what these girls would actually do. an extremely volatile, intense, uh, traveling rock and roll circus, you know, that, that was the epitome of kind of 70s uh, uh, rock and roll success and glamour and excess, and that's just what Led Zeppelin were. Outrageous stories followed the band, like A School of Sharks, that dangerous creature appropriately stars in the most notorious groupie story of all, the Led Zeppelin shark incident. That was the wildest thing I've ever been involved in or saw in my life. It was pretty wild. I don't know whether it really happened. I mean, I don't recall that incident. I remember hearing about it from a Frank Zappa song. Which went from that mood shot. It was 1969 at Seattle's Edgewater Inn, a favorite stopover for rock bands playing in the area. I found this woman who was uh, very eager to do whatever, you know. And um, in this hotel, you can go buy fishing poles and you could fish out the window, right on the water. Basically, what I remember is that Bonzo and I were fishing out the window of the hotel. We heard noise from another room, and of course we didn't want to miss out on anything. And we went over there, and there was some girl lying on the floor. So when they come in, they had this mud shark in their hand. It was either the shark or the snapper. And they had this chick. And the chick was like, up for anything, you know? So before we, we knew anything, the chick was sitting on a chair, and they were like, I, I don't know who it was, I can't remember, they were like hitting her on the back with the mud shark. Hey, lady, you got the love I need. This chick had everything done to her with the fish, with ketchup, with, with bottles, with, ke with butter, with everything that I've ever seen done in my life. I mean, it definitely happened. There was a shark and there was a girl. I was like, you know, I was just shocked. I, I think I was in shock for the whole thing, really. <laughs> Zeppelin always played coy about the incident. Well, you want to know whether I ever did any of these weird and wonderful things? Well, I might have done, but I can't remember it. Whether it was true or not, the shark story stuck around, as groupies spread rumors of the band actually feeding a girl to a bunch of sharks. It was a new low in groupie folklore. What everyone does agree on is that guitarist Jimmy Page wasn't involved. He had his own way with groupies. Part dark prince, part dashing scoundrel, he kept his favorite Lori Maddox under lock and key. I started modeling for a magazine called Star Magazine, which is sort of a cult magazine now, which was a 
early 70s pre-groupy teen magazine that made 13-year-olds look like they were 40 in all Vogue clothes and with musicians and rock stars and um, sort of highlighted these girls as being groupies, but they really weren't. They were just models. Lori was a fixture on the Sunset Strip scene. Jimmy first spotted her at a poolside party at L.A.'s Hyatt House, otherwise known as the Riot House. What happened was I was kidnapped, literally, and um, he told me he was going to be with me, and I said, no, he wasn't, and he said, yes, I am. And then we all ended up at the Rainbow, and we were at the Rainbow, and Richard Cole says to me, get in the bloody car, and if you move, I'll have your head. I'm sure if he said I won her, I would have gone and asked her to get in the car or whatever, or carried her out. And next thing you know, we're at the hotel, I'm walking down the hall, next thing you know, I'm pulled into this door, and there... I was basically kidnapped, and I turn around and look, and there's Jimmy sitting in the corner of the room with a hat and a cane, saying, I told you I'm going to have you. We stayed together secretly for several years. He always left me with the security locked in the room. <laughs> I wasn't really allowed to go very many places with him. But according to Lori, love conquered all. It was worth every minute, <laughs> truly. He was a beautiful person, and he touched my life deeply. Rock and roll on that! Party every day! Not all rock stars are Hollywood handsome, but that's never stopped them from getting groupies. Case in point, Gene Simmons. Groupies, they love you. They don't want anything from you. They just want to be around you. The Kiss bassist claims to have slept with thousands of groupies and has never relied on his looks to woo the ladies. It's all about the star power. Gene will be the first person to tell you he's not the most beautiful man in the world, and by becoming a rock star, it didn't matter what you looked like. He's told me before. He could be a rock star and the ugliest man in the world would get laid 24 hours a day, seven nights a week. And that is what part of the charm is. It's not because he's ugly or not ugly. It's because he is fronting a band that we love and listen to all the time and are obsessed with and muse about and reflect on and are curious about. And I don't think that looks in that sense have so much to do with it at all. When KISS burst onto the scene nearly 30 years ago, the band's Broadway-style theatrics blew rock bands away. Their after-show activities were no less overheated. You know, you take requests, whatever somebody wants you to do. If it was a good night, they wound up with a star in their cry. Probably the biggest thrill is to uh, get up on stage and do the best shows we can. And then, of course, do the encore stuff in the hotel. In groupie circles, Simmons' sexual prowess is legendary. My game Simmons story is X-rated. <laughs> As I was walking past, he just grabbed me and hugged me and started kissing me, jamming his tongue down my throat and pulling my hair. He was really very passionate. He picked me up, threw me over his shoulder, and walked to a door, opened the door, and took me into a janitor's closet. We proceeded to pleasure ourselves in this janitor's closet with Paul Stanley, Billy Squire, and Robin from Cheap Trek standing outside, hooting and howling. There aren't many women out there who won't tell you there's not something a little bit alluring about a man whose tongue is as long as Gene likes to profess his is and show you if you ask. Gene Simmons used to keep it a box of index cards that had the names of every groupie he slept with in a photograph and certain descriptions of their sexual proclivities, what they enjoyed. Um, I love that image because, you know, Gene is a very orderly, entrepreneurial, ambitious guy, and it just makes it seem like he pursued sex the same way he pursues, say, the marketing of Kiss Dolls. As the 70s came to an end, women's lib made groupiedom seem a little less glamorous. Yet Rock's backstage antics barreled on. Coming up, the 80s, an era of loose morals and even looser bra straps. Girls come out the door and they 
out the window and new ones in the door and other ones out the window like revolving. It was very, very, very decadent. Girl rockers get in on the act. You know, you think of male groups and some of the stuff, the shenanigans they get up to. Well, believe it or not, women can get up to some shenanigans too. And the kid who made rock shameless once again. Rock <laughs> were all about decadence, and rock stars indulged like never before. In metal, rocks at the center of excess, that meant girls, and more girls. Even nice boy bands like Def Leppard aspired to Zeppelin-like heights of hedonism. People to this day think there's like cutesy little Def Leppard, and they were as bad as anyone. They were as bad as Led Zeppelin. I mean, you couldn't touch them. It's just the fact they did it really well. Def Leppard looked sweet, almost like teen idols. They attracted more swooning female fans than any other metal band. Great to see 60% females at the gig. You know, they scream louder, they dance, and let's be honest, there was five horny men on stage that are attracted to women. <laughs> On their sold-out 1987 Hysteria tour, stories began brewing about infamous backstage passes and breast-bearing sessions under the stage. We had these passes made up, um, and it was <laughs> it was a smiley face. And we changed the name of the band from Death Letter to Flicker. And basically, the reason we did it was because we become apparent to us that if the promoter came with his wife or his daughter. They had the same pass on as a girl that had maybe 15 of the crew to get backstage, and we didn't think it was fair. So we had full-on groupie passes. It was hard to say whether the women wearing them knew what the passes signified. But according to legend, those who were led beneath the stage during the show-stopping performance of Rock of Ages knew exactly what was expected. They manufactured this, this moment in the show about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through, whereby the guitar players would all go back underneath the stage and Joe and Rick would be left on the stage. Joe would say, well, what shall we talk about? Shall we talk about politics? And the kids would go, boo. And Joe would go, well, shall we talk about sex? And the girls would go, If you went down there during this, we used to during Rock of Ages, I'm not joking, there would be 60 naked girls. And I mean with nothing on, you know, completely. Mothers and daughters performing sexual acts. I mean, it was just, well, it was like, it was like Caligula under the stage. It was a scene worthy of Led Zeppelin. But today, band members deny the action was X-rated. OK, so what were you guys doing on the next day? And it, was any, it wasn't anything, we'd have photos done. It would be like, some of our road crew would go, OK, you want to meet the band? Let's have a look what you got. And, and they'd just flash them. So these girls would come under the stage. It would be as harmless as us going, like that, having a photo. <laughs> I saw the Polaroids afterwards, you see, because I was, I missed out on it. It's like, whoa, who was under there tonight? And all it was, it was just pictures of people from their waist up. That's all. And just so happened, so happened to be like, maybe, you know, a couple of girls. And I think there was one once a mother-daughter team. But that has spread like the mud shark in the Led Zeppelin thing. Def Leppard's fairly clean image sold a lot of albums, so it's not surprising that the group dismisses reports of lewd behavior. The band's American counterparts, however, were never shy about their groupie encounter. This is it. This is where Motley first started out. This is, this is the strip right here. We used to walk up and down these streets we're making twenty dollars a week. Hey, girls! Woo! Okay. We used to come here just looking for girls to feed us. That was the only way we survived out here. L.A. Sunset Strip had always been groupie central, but in the '80s, ruled by bands like Poison and Motley Crue, clubs like the Whiskey, the Rainbow, and the Roxy were crazier than ever. It's kind of like being in a candy store sometimes. Because you go, I want that one and that one and that and that one and that one. 
It was a great decade in L.A. We really ruled the town, and there was nothing off limits for almost like a full 10 years in L.A. And uh, it was just a, it was just a really great time around here. It got pretty crazy. You know, me, Nikki, and Tommy all lived together in an apartment right above the Whiskey Go-Go. So <laughs> I was like, come on back. You know, we invite the, the whole clubs back to our, our, our apartment for parties. And, Parties are going for days, and you know, girls come out the door and go out the window, and new ones in the door, and other ones out the window, like revolving. It's, it's very, very, very decadent. You're always trying to outdo the girl next to you, which means that if girl A won't do this, then you might try it just because that might make you more noticeable to the band. So I think that you get kind of like a friendly and sometimes even unfriendly competition between the girls to see who can do the most outrageous thing. 80s metal bands turned the quest for women into a traveling carnival. It was almost like a parody of the classic rock era, complete with flashy costumes and props. I remember truck drivers, they would have like fishing poles and backstage passes hooked to like, you know, hooked to the ends of them on the fishing line and reel <laughs> them out. And when girls would see them, they'd just kind of reel them to the trucks and they'd have to, you know, to give them a just to get to our security. Backstage, we had a place called the Poison Playpen. We'd actually use the catering room. That's how big a room we needed. And I would get like four older guys and be like, poster, 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 balloons, put the twister game over here, put, you know, Wesson oil in the pool over here. There'd be a condom set up and ashtrays all over the place. Or, you know, room with, with, with 40 girls and three guys. Original 80s hedonists Van Halen had their roadies take a more active role in backstage recruitment. Right. Former frontman David Lee Roth created a plan to ensure he wound up with the very best the crowd had to offer. The notorious scheme was officially known as the Backstage Pass Incentive Program. You know, we hear about the Backstage Pass Incentive Program, you know, and what I had said, was to the crew, everybody gets five backstage passes, and if you go ahead and initial it, then whichever gal I wind up with, if it's got your initials on it, you gave her the backstage pass, you get 100 bucks. David Lee Roth's incentive plan was one of the best examples of capitalism brought into the rock and roll world you've ever heard of. Get her in my bed, and if she's good enough, you'll get 100 bucks for it. And it was so sick and twisted, that it kind of defines the man and the legend that ruled rock. Down my legs. Dave and the rest of the band took full advantage of fan worship before, during, and after the show. You know, people always remind me about my my wild man image, you know, that party monger image, party monster image, you know. To tell you the truth, I've been seeing the same girl for the last four, maybe five days. <laughs> By the late 70s and early 80s, worshipping rock stars had become an equal opportunity line of work. A new fanatic was born, the male groupie. I wouldn't be surprised if there's plenty of guys with broken hearts out there on the road who thought they were going to have a relationship with someone that it just ended up a one night stand. One band they flocked to was The Runaways, featuring hard rock pinup Joan Jett and Lita Ford. They were teenage girls playing heavy music in a man's world. Our audience was mostly dudes. It was just like a sea of denim and leather. What I used to do is I would go to the audience after a show and I would grab a couple guys and I would take them backstage and we'd party. You know, they would trust us. <laughs> and that was kind of stupid because we used to do silly things to them. We'd get them messed up so they just like fall unconscious and then we just we'd paint them up with nail polish and lipstick when the go-go's hit the scene in the early 80s the band played up their girl next door innocence and the boys ate it up but under that sweet facade beat an x-rated heart we were cute and bubbly i mean we were also like you know twisted crazy drug addict sex men. You know, but we were cute and bubbly too, and that's what people responded to. 
These were fun-loving girls. And, you know, you think of male groups and some of the stuff, the shenanigans they get up to. Well, believe it or not, women can get up to some, some shenanigans, too. Some of those shenanigans were revealed when a backstage video emerged featuring one very eager Go-Go fan trying unsuccessfully to get it on with the girls. David has to stop. And you have to watch really intensely no, like you're interested. No, just give me your time. No, I can't even do that. I can't even touch it. We were just so jaded. So we'd be out there like, and thinking, I can't wait till the show's over so I can go get laid. Like all parties, this one had to end. The 90s hit like a wicked hangover, and all of a sudden, the fun was over. But the lusty spirit of the groupie wouldn't stay repressed forever. Next, backstage gets boring as rock stars turn sensitive. Rock stars do want to be rock stars. They want to be the guy next door. Then Sleaze makes a comeback. Signing the girl's breasts, I mean, that's like one of the coolest things to me about being a rock star. And is that concert slut enough? Meet the new groupie, same as the old groupie. Can you give me a hug? A hug? What's a hug? he saw the rise of alternative rock and a whole different kind of rock star. Eddie Vedder and Kurt Cobain were more sensitive than studly, and their female counterparts, like Courtney Love, told women to be sexy for themselves, not the guys. If you love rock so much, stop wearing a black bra and trying to, to sleep with somebody that you think is going to empower you. Empower yourself. You know, get some guitars. This is the 90s. Instead of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the grunge scene was all about playing music, not being a star. Not surprisingly, the groupie scene withered. The rock stars didn't want to be rock stars. They wanted to be the guy next door. So here they are, they're dressing and acting like the mechanic down the street at the garage, while the guy that mows them on, the reaction to the fans, from the fans, especially the female fans, I think it was different. It was less sexual. With the threat of AIDS, rockers began to rethink their priorities. Back then, and even now, music, for the most part, I mean, when we were coming into our manhood, was sexually driven. I mean, I didn't even know about AIDS until probably the very late 80s, early 90s, where I even thought about it. To me, it was always someone else's disease. You know, it wasn't a heterosexual thing. And obviously, that's made a big change, as you've got to be responsible for your, you know, the sex and the, you know, back then, I don't think anyone cared. But as the millennium turned, a new brand of old-fashioned rocker emerged, and he brought the groupie lifestyle back with him. My name is Inspired by old school hip hop and heavy metal stars, artists like Kid Rock and Limp Bizkit proudly embrace decadence. They urged their female fans to bear all during concerts and hinted at a rejuvenated backstage scene. I don't care what anybody says, I'm in it for the music. You're a lion sack. <laughs> Everybody's in it for the music. That's why we're musicians. We love to do music. That's a given. Now, why are you really in it? Money and girls. Watch me hit the bad lines. Hey, you know what look good on you? <laughs> me. <laughs> Guys like Kid Rock or Limp Bizkit or a slew of other bands are like proud to be rock stars. And so now they're out and they're doing it and the kids are relating to them the same way they're relating to the rap artists. Well, I guess it would be nice if I could touch your body. Signing the girl's breast, I mean, that's like one of the coolest things to me about being a rock star. You know, you, uh, you're living this life and people are just pulling their boobs out and you're signing them butts and breasts and things you would never imagine you'd be doing. But even rock stars can get bored with the constant parade of TNA. We have booze. Now we need beer. Yeah, kiss, girls. Kiss for the camera. Meet New York shock rocker, Dope. A band firmly rooted in the traditions of 80s rock star excess. I'm in hell. 
right now. Frontman Ed Sill Dope and the rest of the band live by the classic credo of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, with an emphasis on sex. God bless America. Why do you think I got into this business? I got into this business because I love to play music. It's all I've lived for my whole life. Look how big these things are. The other half of it is the girls that throw themselves at you, and she's just a lunatic. We grew up with rock bands where there was a lot of glamour involved. You know, Motley Crue, Rat, you know, Poison. Guns and Roses. Guns and, you, know. you know, all the way back to Led Zeppelin, you name it. This is rock and roll, man. We didn't get into this so our mothers would approve of the things that we did. Help me. There could be 10 really hot chicks backstage that want to get really intimate with you. Are these bad things? No, these are, these are good things. These are the biggest things I've ever seen in my life. Casey Ray, an exotic dancer and porn star, and her friend Amber are part of a new generation of groupies, professional entertainers with a rock and roll agenda. Is that concert slut enough? The two are getting ready for a dope show in Boston. A key part of the ritual is choosing the right wardrobe to get noticed. I like the pink. I think the pink is very porno looking, and rock stars love Working in the sex industry has its perks. Over the last few years, Casey and Amber have hobnobbed with an impressive list of rock stars. <laughs> I've hung out with and been with some very big fans, today fans, like Korn, Limp Bizkit, Kid Rock, a lot of very big name bands, and they are the best to be around because they're blowing up so big right now. They you know what? They know. There's a troublemaker. Uh -huh. Let's get her big face. Normal guy? I don't like normal guys. Um, rock stars are exciting. They're fun to be around. I've always, always, always been a huge music lover. And if you're not a diehard fan of music, then, you know, the groupie scene, music scene, any scene like that just won't do a thing for you. So the after party. Yes. These would be the shoes of choice for yes, show. Yes, yes, yes. They scream stripper. They <laughs> scream porn star. I've always been beautiful girls with me. And uh, we just get noticed, and usually before we can even try to get backstage or go and ask somebody about going backstage, somebody walks right by us from the road and just goes slap and slaps a backstage pass right on us. Rock and roll! I'm not gonna watch the show from the audience, okay? I'm gonna watch the show from the stage. And maybe we'll give them a show, and that's how we'll get after show concerts. <laughs> it's all a big show. Go, 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 go! Hello. Thanks. We're in. Girls talk their way past security and score a prime spot backstage. Then it's showtime. The real action, however, starts after the show. First order of business, finding a little privacy in the VIP room. I love my job. <laughs> It's like the Howard Stern show. It's like two chicks, you got the blonde and the brunette making out. Do you guys even know each other? Here, wait, let's see if we can do a shot. Put your mouth on. That's good. Oh, rock and roll show. Joining the party is Dope's friend from LA, a groupie who calls herself Bridget the Midget. Wow! <laughs> rock and roll midget. <laughs> the rest of the party will find locally, but Bridget, we have to fly in. She's got to be imported. She's a special kind of girl. My drummer had this thing for her because we, we had a porno movie of hers on our bus. Oh my God. Uh, we were all checking you out, but, you know, it was like designated Nash territory right away. It was like, ah! 
I seriously like it. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't know what it is. It's, it's rebellious. And they're not, you know, 15-year-old groupies. We're, we are adult entertainers, you know, so we're really used to this, and it's fun for us. I'm a chicken box bird! For the boys in Dope, it's not just about having sex. It's about playing ringmaster for the whole backstage circus. You know, this is just people having a good time. We've done all kinds of crazy. I mean, I don't even know where to start. I got nowhere to go. To the drinky lunch, the tequila. To some, the groupie rock star relationship oh might seem misogynist. But those involved say the exploitation works both ways. Girls that are coming up that are enjoying doing this stuff. I'm not degraded at all. <laughs> this is what excites me, and this is what I have fun doing. I really is not missing fun. Just because you're gay doesn't mean that you think that you're gay. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are gay. I mean, if someone thinks that they're exploiting you and you don't feel exploited, you're not necessarily exploited. It's not like you're degrading someone, like you're taking someone and going, all right, in order for you to meet the band, we're going to put you through all these different things. Just getting started. These are, these are things that every man in America would love to take part in. And should we not take part in it because it's right there in front of us and this is morally wrong? The girls know up front that being a groupie is all about living for the moment. If you go in thinking you're gonna get a relationship or a husband or a boyfriend, it's not gonna happen. This man has beautiful eyes. Is that not true that every girl has a fantasy to hang out with rock stars and hotel rooms? It's a really great way that you can live out a fantasy. You don't know really that they're married with families. You don't know that they have girlfriends. You don't know that they live with somebody until after you've already experienced it. Can you give me a hug? A hug? It's a hug. Life goes on. On to the next show. Here's your book this. Coming up, Ruby's invade cyberspace. The penis chart is definitely a good reference if you want to. Uh, find out what they don't tell you in the magazine. I don't know if I was a guy I'd want that much information out there, but I guess that's a risk you take if you're in a band. From the hippie chicks of the 60s to today's backstage porn queen, the status of groupies has changed dramatically over the last four decades. As rock and roll became a multi-million dollar industry, the relationship between artists and groupies became much less personal. Thanks to the web, that's all changing again. Having the internet makes now more like the 60s and 70s. It makes it easier for you to be a star, it makes it easier for you to get the information you need. Websites like Nico's Intimate Notebook, Metal Sludge and Groupie Central are virtual gossip clearinghouses where groupies can discuss the most intimate rock star details. If um, Jane Doe in Idaho sleeps with the lead singer of any given band and she wants to post it on groupiecentral.com, everyone's going to know all about that guy in that band. Nico's Intimate Notebook.com was started by Groupie carrying on a family tradition. Nico's mom, Josette, has been part of the backstage scene for three decades. It's kind of funny when we first meet a new band because they never realize that she's my mom until like, she reassures them that, yeah, I really am her mother. And I am so flattered. They'll stand between us and look <laughs> at us both and, ooh, mother, daughter. In the old days, mom kept a diary of her rock star conquest. Now, daughter Nico posts her own experiences on the website so fans can share in her backstage triumphs. She gets a lot of emails from record companies that have seen the, the website, and they want their band on it. They want to be on Nico's Intimate Notebook. For something a little more explicit, there's GroupieCentral.com, the definitive Groupie website. It's allowing fans to express their creativity and their feelings in a new way takes a little bit of the power away from the star, puts it in the hands of the fan, and I always think that's a good thing. Groupies like Malin and Exotic Dancer use the site to keep tabs on all their rock star conquests, past and future. I found out about Groupie Central actually through a girlfriend of mine who goes out with a guy in a band, so the first thing I did was run home and get on my computer to go and look at it too. 
to see what was being said about who, including a few of my exes. It's like a joking thing, and it might be, you know, if a friend of mine's on GroupyCentral.com and they say something about him, he'll be getting a phone call in 10 minutes. And, Five inches, dude, what's up with that? Insofar as information and knowledge can be considered power today, I think that websites like GroupyCentral.com are empowering because they have pieces of practical advice like don't sleep with the bassist who beats up women. Watch out for so-and-so. He poses a risk for AIDS. Things like that, I think, are actually really helpful. As detailed as it is, Ruby Central isn't the most revealing site on the web. That honor belongs to MetalSludge.com. Metal Sludge kicks ass. Kendra Jade is a dancer, porn star, and sludgeaholic. They are the inquirers of the music world, and it's pretty funny that um, you know fans actually hear them sometimes. She says the site is a great resource for aspiring groupies, especially the infamous penis chart. The penis chart is definitely a good reference if you want to uh, find out what they don't tell you in the magazine. Kendra's even lent her own backstage expertise to the website, airing rock stars dirty laundry online. I've definitely made a couple of people upset. She says a groupie's got every right to kiss and tell. If you're gonna do something, then don't get mad at me because I talk about it. After all, no matter where you rank, it's only rock and roll. Go! Your information's a little dirtier, a little faster, um, a little trashier than you're gonna get in a print magazine. And who doesn't enjoy that on their coffee break, you know? Groupies, they may not be politically correct, but as a rock icon, they're as important as a lead singer or guitar god. And with rock star access back in style, so are the groupies, bringing with them that same old lust for life.